Good evening. Welcome back. If you were here this morning, and if you weren't, we're glad you're here tonight also. Uh, song sheets or on the screen, Good Christian Men Rejoice, as we begin together this evening. Good Christian Men Rejoice. I'll invite you to stand with me, if you're able, to sing together. shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you that you came, that we might be saved. Father, we pray that you would just help us to uh, understand all that you've done for us, that it would fill us with joy, especially at this season as we celebrate uh, together the birth of your son. Father, we just pray that we would be excited because of that joy and we would tell out that good news, that we could rejoice and let it ring to those that were around about. Thank you for uh, this time that we can be together as we lift our voices. Might we honor and glorify you as we do that together. As we look at your word, might you encourage us and challenge us again as you do every time and just help us to Leave here ready to serve you because we love you for all that you've done for us. We'll pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, the fellows are coming for a special. Yes. 
singing how great our joy how great our joy together good to see some smiles as we sing too Well, 
It's a thought, isn't it? Hard sometimes to remember when we're doing things. So. Next song would be While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks by Night. songs continue next week? I haven't looked. They do? Great. One more week anyway, maybe. <laughs> Be careful, maybe not. <laughs> it only comes once a year if we get to sing them for a few weeks. We learn how to play them again for a few weeks, <laughs> and then we forget them. Oh, holy night, would you join me in standing as we sing this together, if you will, and we will have the interlude between uh, from the very beginning. So.
Thank you for that singing. You may be seated. Pastor. It's a joy for us once again to be able to consider the Christmas story according to Matthew. This, of course, should be somewhat familiar to us if we've been around for the last couple of years, but it's amazing how quickly things that we have covered move to the back of our mind or fly away from our mind entirely. Um, and that's true for me as well as it is for you. You would think that I would remember everything I say from the pulpit. It's amazing how quickly I forget the things that I've studied. Um, but the good news is the more you study your Bible, the more you study things like the Christmas story, the more it simply becomes a part of you. You may not remember every little nugget that you've received over the years as you've listened to this story, but it does become a part of you and it does transform your life. And it's a joy for us to return to this passage year after year after year and to look at it through fresh eyes. Well, as Pastor Norton shared with us this morning, we see that Jesus' life always provokes two responses. You can choose either to accept him, you can choose to accept his message, or you can choose to reject his message. And what did we see this morning? Acceptance or rejection? Or, or, or rejection? We saw both, didn't we? Because we had the wise men who traveled from the east, who traveled from a very far distance in order to worship the newborn king. That was the right response, and that is the right response for us today. But we also saw rejection. Who do we see rejection from? From King Herod. King Herod is a model for us of those who reject Jesus because they see him as a threat. And so Jesus' life always provokes that kind of response. That certainly is the case later on in his adult ministry. He says a lot of things that people hear, and he does a lot of things that they see, and they instantly are drawn to that. At the same time, when they stick around to hear what his message actually is, they're not so sure that that's something that they're interested in receiving. But the Christmas story reminds us that we need to receive him as our king because that is exactly who he is. And that's an important part of Matthew's purpose, isn't it? All of the Gospels were written from a unique perspective in order to give us a unique window into the life of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that Matthew wants us to come away absolutely convinced of is the idea that Jesus is our king. He is our Messiah, and he has come in order to claim the rule and to claim the throne of his father, David. So Jesus is our king, and he is the one that we have to accept. Well, as we conclude our consideration of the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 2, uh, Jesus finds himself in a variety of different places, a variety of different locations. Um, and there are four places we're going to see Jesus. We're going to see him in Bethlehem. We're going to see him in Egypt. We're going to see him in Ramah. And finally, by the end of the chapter, he will have arrived at Nazareth. And those places are not just happenstance. Jesus did not arrive in those places simply by chance. Each one of them fulfilled prophecy in the Old Testament. Matthew's gonna make sure that we don't miss that as we look at this passage. We're also going to see the fact that in this passage, the Lord preserves his Messiah. He preserves his deliverer. And there is nothing that can thwart God's plan of salvation. If God determines to save, he's going to do it. And he will do all that is necessary to make that happen. So we see the Messiah threatened and we see the Messiah kept safe. So as we begin, let's look together at Matthew chapter 2. And I'll begin reading in verse 13. Matthew 2 and verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night, and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. So first we see that the Lord moves Jesus and his family away from Bethlehem and instead into the land of Egypt. And why did that have to happen? Because of, because of King Herod. Herod is determined to destroy the king that has been prophesied. Isn't that an ironic thing? Isn't it an amazing thing that Herod would put himself in the way of God's anointed king? It's never a good idea to stand in the way of God and his plans, is it? 
You can think of other people in the Bible who did that. Perhaps Pharaoh is the ultimate example in the Old Testament. You think about that, that great story of the Exodus where God has determined to deliver his people. After 400 years, he is going to fulfill his promises to Abraham. He is going to take his people from the land of Egypt, from slavery, and he is going to bring them to the promised land of Canaan. Well, what does Pharaoh conclude? I don't know this God. I don't know Yahweh, and I am not going to let his people go. He puts himself directly in the way of the fulfillment of God's plan. And what are the results of that? The most powerful nation in the whole world at that time is brought to its knees before the power of God. And yet here we have Herod, who is turning around and doing the same exact thing. Sound like a good idea to you? I don't think so. I don't think that that was a wise plan on his part. But he had his own agenda, didn't he? He had his own goals, and he saw the Lord's Messiah as an obstacle to those goals. And so he was going to do everything that he could in order to thwart God's fulfillment of those goals. It's interesting that Herod really did have some level of confidence in God's prophecies concerning the Messiah, didn't he? Because what did he, what did he ask as soon as the wise men came into town, asking, where is the Messiah, the one-born king of the Jews? Yeah, he wanted to know where he was to be born. In other words, what do the prophecies say? What does my Old Testament say? And so he realized that those things were predicted, that this was something that God had already revealed, and yet he was still so determined to resist God's plan that he was going to do that regardless of what God had said. Well, going back even to the time of Abraham, the Israelites often found refuge in Egypt. And of course, there, there were some negative consequences that occasionally came from that. But the result of that is there would have been a community of Jews in Egypt around this time when Joseph and Mary picked up, took their family, and came to the land of Egypt to flee from the wrath of Herod. Um, and Egypt would have been about 90 miles from Bethlehem. So this would have been a significant journey. 90 miles doesn't sound much like much to you and me. We're, we're used to jumping in our cars and driving 90 miles without much of a second thought. But it would have been a bit of a journey for them in order to flee from the wrath of Herod. And of course, Joseph is going at the word of the angel of the Lord. Are you surprised to see Joseph responding to a vision like this at this point in the story? No. He, he, he's already done this, right? If he can accept the Lord's revelation that his wife is going to have a child and that child is the product of the Holy Spirit, if he can accept that as, as, her, as her husband, then I think he's going to accept this message that he's receiving from the Lord as well. Now that dream happened to provide warning in order to ensure that Jesus, the Messiah, God's deliverer, would not be destroyed. Sort of reminds you of the story of Moses when he was a baby, doesn't it? And so there are a lot of connections that we can make between the story of God's deliverance through the Messiah and the story of God's deliverance of his people in the Old Testament from the land of Egypt. But this dream happened not only to provide warning, but also to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. God intends through each of the steps in the Messiah's life to ensure that we would know that this is the Messiah. This is not somebody who is simply making messianic claims. This is somebody who actually has the credentials in order to back those claims up. Now, what is, what is the location of the passage that Matthew cites to show us that Jesus is fulfilling prophecy even before he's old enough, perhaps as a human, to fully understand what's going on? Okay, uh, there, uh, you, could, you could look at numbers. That would be an option. Um, it also seems to refer to the book of Hosea. So if you look at your, if you, if you look at your uh, cross-references in your Bible, if you have a Bible with cross-references, you might notice Hosea 11, verse 1. Or you might notice Hosea 2, verse 15. This is what those verses say. Uh, then this is back in the Old Testament dur during the prophetic period in Israel's history. Uh, Hosea 11, 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, who is the son that is being talked about in that verse, do you suppose? Sounds a lot like Israel, doesn't it? Yeah, because the talk, it's talking about the Exodus, talking about the Lord calling his children out of the, of the, the land of Egypt. Then Hosea 2.15 says this, There she shall answer as in the days of her youth, talking about the nation of Israel at the time when she came out of the land of of Egypt. So you have language that's being used to describe the nation of Israel 
as the child or as the son of the Lord. Is that what's going on in our passage tonight? Are we talking about the nation of Israel? No, we're actually, we're actually talking about the Messiah. We're talking about Jesus Christ. That raises a question. Is Matthew's use of his Old Testament legitimate? Well, you're, you're, you're good conservative Christians. You know the right answer to that question, don't you? Of course, his use of the Old Testament is legitimate. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit. What he is saying is the perfect revelation of God to us. But perhaps it's not a bad idea for us to think about how he is using those Old Testament references in order, in order to show that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah that he claims to be. Uh, there is another passage you could look at if you want to see Israel referred to as the son of the Lord, and that it would be in Exodus 4, verses 22 and 23. You can write that down if you want to look at that later. The point is simply that Israel is referred to as the firstborn son of Yahweh. And Hosea, of course, as we've seen, he's using the word to refer to Israel, not necessarily to refer directly to the Messiah. He could have referred to Israel in any number of ways, and yet he chose to use the word son to describe the nation of Israel. That's interesting because throughout most of Hosea, he uses an illustration of Israel to describe Israel's relationship to the Lord. Does anybody know what that illustration is? It's not the illustration of a son to a father, the relationship of a husband to a wife. And Israel, of course, has been unfaithful to the Lord, like a wife might be unfaithful to her husband. And yet, in this situation, he uses the word son. And that leaves open the possibility of a connection to Christ that we would not necessarily have seen otherwise. Now, is it legitimate for us to read our Old Testament and see references to a son and connect them to Jesus? Is Jesus ever referred to as a son in the Old Testament? Yes. The answer is yes, he is. Listen, listen to what is said uh, in Isaiah 9, verse 6, this classic Christmas passage. For to us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. What about Psalm 2, that, that classic passage that talks about the conflict that the nations experience in their rebellion against the Lord and against his Messiah? Psalm 2, verse 7 says, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. What would you think of that verse, reading it as a Jew in the Old Testament? I, I, think, I, would have been, I think I might have been kind of lost I, I'm not sure I would have made the connection to the Messiah, and yet it's very clear that there's more going on here than, than the, the Jew of the Old Testament would have been able to understand based on the information that they had at that time. It's clear that the Son is immediately connected to Yahweh. And then, of course, we have the great giving of the, the Lord's covenant with King David, and he says in 2 Samuel 7, he will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You assume he's talking about Solomon, right? Because Solomon is the one who built the temple. But then he goes on to say, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And that does sound a lot like King Solomon when you think about a lot of the information that's given there. But do you know what the book of Hebrews applies that passage to, that wording to, when it says, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son? It applies it to Jesus Christ. And so the Lord is talking specifically about Christ. This is one of those situations where you have what we would call Bible typology. And there are a lot of weird things that people do with typology. You should not necessarily listen to everyone that starts talking about Bible typology. Because they'll come up with lots, lots of crazy ideas that they will read into the Bible that really aren't there when you look at it, when you read it like a normal human document. But sometimes the Lord does give prophecies in this way. The exodus from Israel was a real event that happened in history, but it also was designed by the Lord to picture the salvation that you and I experience through Jesus Christ. And Jesus' own return from Egypt was a kind of second exodus, right? Because he starts out in Egypt, then what happens? The Lord brings him back. He now has a purpose to fulfill in the midst of his own people. So 
when we come to this matter of typology, because we need to restrain ourselves so that we don't start making up all sorts of things that aren't actually in our Bibles, that aren't actually in the text, it's important that we limit ourselves to the types that are made explicit within the Bible itself. The Bible has the right to determine which types are actually prophetic and given by God to picture something else. We don't have the right to just make those up on our own. If we do that, it's really more our insight than it is God's insight that he has revealed to us in his word. So we could make all sorts of things in the Bible into types, but that's, that's not going to be legitimate for us to do that, even though many Christians have read their Bibles in that way, making up all sorts of connections. But that is, that is how the, re, the Hosea reference applies to Jesus. It applies like a, like a type, right? Because Hosea is describing a historical event, but then he's saying, this is going to happen again. And you're going to recognize it when it happens with the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we leave this section of the passage, which talks about the flight of Jesus' family to Egypt, I do, I do want to raise an issue that seems to be coming up more and more in recent years. Uh, you may have been accustomed to hearing this passage applied in this particular way. See, see if this sounds familiar to you. Jesus was a refugee. You would want to show kindness and compassion to Jesus. Therefore, you need to adopt my immigration policy. Does that sound familiar to you? Have you encountered other Christians saying this maybe in conversation or maybe as you're uh, scrolling through Facebook, you see links to different blogs, different articles? I know I certainly have. I tend to pay attention to articles like that. Um, and there is no question, of course, that we should have all the compassion in the world for refugees. That being said, I don't think that's the main point of this passage. I don't think that that is the main application of the verses that you and I have just read together tonight. There are other passages that can help us with that issue that can perhaps provide some guidance. But this passage is designed to make a point about Jesus, isn't it? It's not designed to show us a particular political point in our, in our own contemporary situation. It's designed to show us that Jesus is utterly unique. And when he comes along and he claims to be the son of God, and when he is identified as the son of David, you and I should, should sit up and take notice because he actually is the son of God. He is the son of David. So we should come away recognizing that this is just another episode in Jesus' life. And even, even the ordinary events, the happenings in Jesus' life, those are designed to show us that there is no one else like him. He is completely unique, and he is completely qualified to be our Messiah and to take control, to reign on David's throne. We see that because of the Old Testament connections, right? The fact that Jesus went to Egypt and the Lord brought him back out of Egypt, we are supposed to see as yet another qualification that he fulfilled prophecy, and he is qualified to be our Messiah. So that experience that we just read about, it fulfills Old Testament prophecy in such a way that it makes it clear that he is the very Son of God. And it shows us that nothing can stop God's plan of salvation. That's the main point I think that we should take away from this passage. And sometimes we miss that. If we're too quick to carry our, our political agendas into our reading of Scripture, then we can end up missing the point that the Lord wants us to actually take away. Um, and you understand that if you set some of, some of your own ideas aside and simply let the text speak for itself and interpret it within its larger context. So that's just kind of a brief side note, uh, an encouragement to be careful about how we use some of these passages in the Christmas story. I, I don't think that people always let the text speak for itself and give, it, give us its message rather than our own. Of course, Herod isn't going to respond to this very well, is he? We see Herod's response in verses 16 through 18. Let's go ahead and read that together. Verse 16 says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. You remember, he asked them about that in our passage this morning. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they are no more. Do you expect a passage like this to be a part of the Christmas story? 
Maybe not in some ways, right? Because we think of Christmas as such a time of joy, and we think of the message of Christmas as a joyful message, and yet sandwiched in the midst of that whole story, we have this horrific episode that happens as Herod tries to destroy the Messiah that the Lord has sent. This is such an extreme atrocity. It's almost hard for us to imagine how something like this could ever happen. But Pastor Norton reminded us this morning, Herod was no stranger to atrocities, right? He was known as a great builder. He had many great political accomplishments during his reign, but he was not a moral man. He was a deeply immoral man who did many deeply immoral things. Now, you might wonder how Herod could have gotten away with something like this politically. The fact is, this event may not have been widely known or reported after it happened. We know that Bethlehem was not a large city, right? In fact, Micah makes a point of that. He talks about Bethlehem, and he says, Bethlehem's not, you're not a great city, and yet out of you will come the Messiah. He was making that point specifically that Bethlehem was not a large city. So there may not actually have been many children who were at this age in that area. But of course, it is the great tragedy that surrounds the birth of Jesus. And once again, I I hasten to remind us that even though Herod strikes us as somebody who is utterly beyond the pale, somebody who goes so far above and beyond what we could imagine anybody doing, he does represent all of those who feel threatened by Jesus and who reject him because he threatens the goals that they have, those who are unable to receive Jesus because of their hard hearts. Herod could have received Jesus with joy. He could have joined the wise men in worshiping him. Would Jesus have ultimately been a threat to King Herod? Of course not. He was, he was a baby. He was an infant. Herod was dead, as, as Pastor Norton mentioned, very early on in the life of Jesus. And yet he missed out on this, this blessed opportunity to receive Jesus as God's gift. Don made the point of emphasizing that line from the one hymn that we sang tonight, talks about cherishing this gift well. Jesus is God's gift to us. He was God's gift to men like Herod, and yet Herod did not have the eyes to see Jesus as a gift from God. He only had the eyes to see Jesus as a threat to his reign, to his rule, and his power. Now, you may be wondering what the relevance of Jeremiah is to this passage. How does Jeremiah fit into this, and how does Rachel fit into this? Well, of course, Rachel is the favored wife of Jacob. Jacob, of course, being the patriarch, the father of the nation of Israel, other than Abraham, of course, who was the father, the grandfather of Jacob. But when Rachel died, she wasn't buried in the family burial plot, that cave of Machpelah, that Abraham purchased as a burying place for his family. Where was she buried? In, in Bethlehem, right? Uh, in, this, in this same area where this tragedy took place. And you can see that in Genesis 35, 19, if you wanted to check that. So that's the place where Rachel was buried. Um, and there is a quote now that we have given to us from the book of Jeremiah. You can look in your cross-references. This comes from Jeremiah 31, verse 15. And this is a passage that is referring to the weeping over the nation of Israel because of the Babylonian captivity. The Babylonian captivity happened many centuries before what we're reading about in Matthew tonight. It actually happened in 586 BC, so nearly 600 years before. You have this passage that is describing the lamentation and the weeping over the dead children of Israel as a result of Israel's captivity to Babylon. Ramah was, in fact, a place that the Israelites would have passed on their way to captivity in Babylon. And now, centuries later, we have the people of Israel yet again sorrowing because of the consequences of sinfulness and the consequences of rejection of God's message and God's God's overtures of love to them. This is a tragic part of the Christmas story. But was God in control when those events happened? Absolutely. Absolutely. And God is always in control, and he is able to bring good even from the very worst circumstances. Even though the Lord allows this to happen, he is yet so in control of the situation that he is able to spare the Messiah to ensure that Herod is not successful in wiping him out in God's saving plan. There is hope even in the midst of great suffering, great sorrow, and great darkness. Jeremiah 31 is in some ways 
um, a dark passage. And yet, that is one of the classic New Covenant passages in the Old Testament. If you want to read about the New Covenant that we are experiencing as Christians in the 21st century in the Old Testament, one of the two places that you go is Jeremiah 31. And so there is hope in the midst of suffering and in the midst of human sinfulness. That leads us then to verses 19 to 23. And here we see the return from Nazareth. Jesus was not going to stay in Egypt. He was going to return in order to accomplish the Lord's mission that he had given him. So verse 19 says, When Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So why was Jesus in all of the different places we've talked about tonight? He was fulfilling prophecy. He had to be in all these places in order to show, even in the events of his birth and his early childhood, that he was God's Messiah. Why was he in Bethlehem? That was where the Messiah was to be born. Why was he he in Nazareth? Because it was said that he would be called a Nazarene. So all all of these locations that we see Jesus in, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Nazareth, whether it's Bethlehem, This is to show us that he is, in fact, the promised Messiah that the Lord has sent. Now, as we have seen, Herod thought he was going to resist God's plan while the Lord put an end to Herod. Herod, Herod, whatever he thought he was accomplishing by his his atrocity, it didn't end up working out. He ends up dead, and the Lord tells Joseph yet again in another dream to return to the land of Israel. But he's still nervous because we have Herod's son on the throne, which he thinks is maybe not altogether that much better. Um, And so he ends up going instead to Galilee. Where does he go in Galilee? To Nazareth, yeah. And that was by, once again, the Lord's design. Now, you, you can research the background to this, why it was important that he would be called a Nazarene. Um, there, you, you're not going to necessarily find an Old Testament verse that makes a point about the Messiah being called a Nazarene. But that, Naz- that Nazarene word, it sounds a lot like the Hebrew word for a branch or a shoot. Does that sound familiar to you? Yes, because the Messiah is called in the Old Testament a branch or a shoot. That, that word, uh, nesh, nesh, nesher, uh, that is the Hebrew word that sounds like Naz- Nazarene uh, or Nazareth. So that may well be the connection that Matthew has in mind by calling Jesus a Nazarene. Now, was Jesus a Nazarite? Recalling our Old Old Testament knowledge here, right? Who was the famous Nazarite of the Old Testament? Samson, right? And, And he made a vow, and part of that vow was that he would not cut his hair. You remember that story. Did Jesus make a vow like that? Is that what's being said here? No, we're just noting the fact that he was from Nazareth. And so Jesus is never said to have been a Nazarite He is a Nazarene, which simply means that he came from this place called Nazareth. So it was important that Jesus would grow up in Nazareth so that he could be considered a Nazarene. But that identification came with some downsides, didn't it? Have you noticed this in your reading of the Gospels? I'll invite you to turn over to John chapter 1 so so we can see just how this went over for Jesus later on in his life. John chapter 1. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 43. Jesus is just beginning his earthly ministry. He's a much older man than he is at the time that we're seeing him described here in Matthew chapter 2, where he is a toddler at that point. So John chapter 1, beginning with verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. You recognize these as names of some of the 12 disciples. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is the Messiah. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? What a a statement to make, right? I I don't know what city in this area or what town in this area you think of as a modern day Nazareth, 
maybe something comes to mind. I'm not, I'm not going to throw any particular local town under the bus, but you can think maybe of a city in Barry County, and you hear that somebody's from there, and you're like, can anything good come out of that town? That's, that's the reputation that Nazareth has at this time. Of course, Philip goes on and says, come and see. Uh, and Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Boy, that was sure a flip-flop, wasn't it? He starts out by saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then before you know it, he's saying, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Tell you what, that's, that's somebody who had faith. That was somebody who was willing to hear the message of God and to receive that, even if it went against his natural prejudices. Look with me now, if you would, at John chapter 7. This is another place where we see how Jesus' background was perceived. John chapter 7, just a few pages over if you're already in John's gospel. John 7, and I'll begin reading in verse 40. It says, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Jesus, of course, has just been speaking. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Ironically, they are noticing something that is important about Jesus' birth, aren't they? But they don't know the whole story about Jesus and his origin, so they've missed what you and I know because we're so familiar with the Christmas story that Jesus did, in fact, start off in Bethlehem. So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So again, you have this, this preconception, this prejudice that the religious leaders of the day have, and they look at Jesus and his background in Nazareth, his background in Galilee, and say, this is no Messiah. This is no king of Israel. The opposite response to Nathaniel, right? What made the difference? The difference is faith. That is, that is what makes the difference, whether you have faith to receive God's message that he gives to you and the confirmations that he gives to support that message. Nazareth was a despised place. It was despised by Nathaniel. It was despised by these religious leaders. And Jesus was a despised person, was he not? And once again, that was predicted in our Old Testament that, that the Messiah would be despised that he would be a man of sorrows, that he would be acquainted with grief, that he would be rejected by his own people that he came to. That was predicted of him. But not everyone felt that way about Jesus, did they? There were some who had the eyes to see who he was and to accept him on faith, even though the majority of the people in their culture, the majority of people in their nation did not receive him as their Messiah. So as we conclude our consideration of this passage tonight, we want to think about the application of this message to us. Obviously, these events happened many centuries ago. These people have all passed on. They're, they're no longer going to be affected by the message that you and I have considered together tonight. But you and I can learn from their examples, can't we? We can learn from the examples of those who accepted Jesus and who worshiped him, who gave him the praise and the welcome that he deserved. And we can also learn from those who tried to resist him and tried to prevent him from coming and reigning over his people, Israel. Herod felt threatened in his reign by Jesus. As it happened, he was not successful in overthrowing Jesus. He put himself in the way of God and his fulfillment of his plan. That is never a good place to put yourself. God will always accomplish his purpose. Whose reign ultimately was brought to an end? It was Herod's. And it didn't take very long. It didn't take very many years for that to happen. What happened to Jesus and his kingdom? He is reigning right now today, and he will reign for all eternity on the throne of his father, David. Herod failed miserably, 
even as he carried out extreme measures in order to try to get his way and to accomplish his agenda. Now, of course, I, I have no concern tonight that any of you would consider murdering children in order, in order to accomplish your purpose for your life, in order to fulfill your dreams, whatever those might look like. That's not a concern that we have tonight. But are you threatened by Jesus' reign? Might you be threatened by Jesus' reign? He deserves and he demands our allegiance and our submission. But if we come to him with our own agenda, he's gonna seem like an obstacle to our plans, isn't he? He's, he's gonna get in the way of that. He's gonna demand things of us. He's gonna ask us to do things that we don't necessarily want to do. Let me encourage you tonight if you see Jesus in that way. If you see Jesus as a threat who might call you to do something that you don't want to do, don't let your own mis misinformed agenda or dreams Keep you from embracing this king, this divine king who has come down to us. He is reigning right now on the throne of his father, David. He is going to rule unchallenged through all eternity. Do not try to put your own agenda above your submission to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Submit to his reign, and then you can rejoice in his coming. Christmas is not just gonna be a time for you to spend time with family, to think about Santa, to exchange gifts, Christmas is going to be a time when we rejoice in the coming of our King and our Savior. You will be able to experience that joy of Christmas. It can't compare to what the world celebrates at this season. The fact is, there is no contest between our kingdoms and the Lord's kingdom. If you refuse to submit to the Lord's kingdom, his kingdom will triumph over yours because every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. How much better would it be to receive him with gladness and open arms now rather than waiting, trying to resist his rule and then only discovering when it is too late that all of your dreams, all of your plans, all of your purposes have been brought to nothing because that is what happens when we set ourselves and our purposes against God. God's will, God's plan will triumph. And I say this first and foremost tonight to urge you that I don't know if there are any unbelievers in, our, in this room tonight but if there are, I would encourage you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Turn away from your sins, submit to his lordship, and acknowledge his authority over your life. That would be a wonderful application and response to the message tonight. But this message is also relevant for Christians, isn't it? This, this isn't something that you and I necessarily have down pat. It's not something that we've necessarily fully arrived at. Sometimes we as Christians need to be reminded that Jesus is God's great gift to us and not a threat to our happiness. Have you ever heard Christians that think of Jesus that way? They're like, I'm a Christian, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to give this particular relationship up. Or I don't want to experience the suffering that may come to me if I take a stand for Christ. You hear people make statements like that. We need to remember that Jesus is not a threat to our ultimate happiness. The, the experience of denying ourselves, that's a daily thing for us as Christians, isn't it? You have done that in the past, and you continue to strive to do that today in every single day of your life. And there are some days when that seems like a sacrifice, when it feels like you are giving up a lot in order to submit to Jesus' rule over your life. That may be especially the case if you look around you and you see unbelievers. Seems like they're pretty happy. Seems like they're doing well. Seems like they're wealthy. Seems like they're in good health. Seems like they're enjoying life. And maybe you're not. Maybe you are struggling, even as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it's that you're single and you want to be married, and yet year after year after year, God withholds that desire from you. Maybe you want to be financially secure, and yet for whatever reason, you just find yourself living on the edge month after month after month. God permits you to continue to live life on the brink. Maybe you want to be healthy. Which of us doesn't want that, right? Of course we want to be healthy, and yet you have experienced year after year the effects of debilitating diseases and chronic pain. Perhaps you want to be loved and appreciated, and yet God calls you to ministries where you find yourself in difficulty, struggling, ministering to thankless people, doing thankless things. This is something that the Lord sometimes calls his children to. God ex allows us to experience these kinds of hardships. You know what? If you're looking at your life from a worldly perspective, 
that's going to feel like a sacrifice. That's going to feel like a hardship. It can feel like a raw deal. But remember that you get Jesus. Even if you endure all those things, at the end of the day, you still have Jesus Christ and your relationship with him. And you get all of God's promises to you through Christ. The, the Bible tells us that the worst hardships that you and I can endure on this, on this globe, in this life, God will more than make up for that in eternity. The hardships, the sufferings of this life are only temporary. And so if the trade that we make as Christians to submit to Jesus, to receive him as our Savior and our Lord, if it seems like a sacrifice to you, then maybe we need to spend some time this week contemplating our Savior and what he has done for us and what he has given to us, remembering his kindness, remembering the greatness of his promises to us. If you appreciate Jesus properly, then you're not going to see his reign in your life as a threat. You're not going to see it as a danger for your happiness. It will be a source of joy and comfort and encouragement even in the darkest days of your life if you truly understand who he is and you are willing to receive him for who he is. So let me encourage you with that tonight. Receive Jesus as your savior and as your king. You don't wanna be, you don't wanna be Herod in the story of your life. You want to be numbered with those who understood who Jesus was and were willing to accept him and understood that what they were getting through, God, through him as God's gift to them was far greater than any of the other things that they could possibly have pursued. Is that your perspective on your life? I trust that it is. And I trust that it's increasingly becoming your perspective on your life as you grow and as you mature in Christ. And if that's true, then you can sing the song Joy to the World with all of the confidence and all of the joy in your heart because you are rejoicing in his reign, not only in your life, but over this world. And that'll give you confidence when it looks like the world around you is falling to pieces, won't it? Because Jesus is reigning, even though it's in the midst of his enemies, even though we see the nations shaking their fists at God, we see people rejecting God and his commands. He is reigning and he will rule over all. We can rejoice in that as we celebrate Christmas this season. And I'll invite us to affirm that together as we close our service tonight. Let's go ahead and stand together. Uh, we'll sing for our musicians. It's song number 125. 125. We'll sing all the stanzas of joy to the world. And may the Lord give us the grace to sing this from our hearts as we rejoice in the coming of our King.
trust that the Lord has given you the ability to sing that from your heart tonight. And may the Lord give us the grace to carry that joy with us as we go into this new week. Whatever challenges the Lord has in store for us, the Lord is our King. We are his people, and we are representing him to the world around us. May the Lord give us the grace to do that effectively this week. Thank you. You are dismissed. Thank you.